So we're here to talk about cybernetics for the masses, which is to say how you and I and Left Anonym here can hack ourselves and hack our bodies. First of all, uh, my name's Left. I work with mostly implants. They call me a biohacker. Uh, this is experimentation on the lowest of low budgets. I, I have no budget, no money, no anything. So all I work with is stuff that you can get in a kitchen and that you can work with, you know, junk, basically. If it's under 50 euros, I've got it. Otherwise, no. So my goal is functional subdermal electronics. Welcome to the secret world of biohacking, a small underground movement that sees its members taking cybernetics and custom evolution into their own hands. The field of cybernetics and human enhancement is mostly dominated by academics and corporations, but the biohacking community, or grinders as they're also called, are making their mark. Comprised of hobbyists, transhumanists, and the morbidly curious, they congregate on special online message boards such as biohack.me and share information and ideas about enhancing the human body free of institutional meddling. Biohackers are able to source components and supplies for cybernetics online using various websites including some that have sprouted up over the years to cater for this niche but growing community. It is with these components biohackers are able to forge their own implants that will combine flesh with technology and give them varying degrees of enhancement not normally available to the average person. I'm Kevin Warwick, I'm a professor at both Coventry and Reading Universities. I'm also known as Captain Cyborg, a name that was given to me, probably because of my implant experiments which I've done a number of over the years. Professor Kevin Warwick is considered by some the forerunner of the biohacking movement. It is his early work with cybernetics that has inspired many to explore transhumanism. The first implant I had is an RFID, radio frequency identification device, which was implanted in my upper left arm and we got it linked to the computer in my building at Reading University, so as I moved around the computer knew where I was, so it opened doors for me, switched on lights, said hello when I came through the front door. And it was really just showing at that time that you could have an implant like this. I was the first human to have an RFID a long time ago. Um, but I moved on from there to having what's now called a brain gate. This is 100 electrodes, which was fired into the nervous system in my left arm to link my nervous system with the computer and then onto the internet. And we did a whole series of experiments, such as me moving my hand and my neural signals also going out to the robot hand. And when the robot hand moved, there were sensors in the fingertips of the robot hand, the signals were sent back to stimulate my nervous system so I could feel how much force the robot hand was applying. Transhumanism has been around for a while. I take it as being, you're taking a human and you're linking them integrally with technology. So they're, they're no longer just a human, they're part human and part technology. So I don't really count people into that who are riding a bicycle or who've got glasses and things. I think that's the technology is separate. But when the technology becomes part of them, um, You've then got a question, is it just for therapeutic use? So say somebody with a cochlear implant help their hearing. I don't know that I would classify, I would classify them as a transhumanist, but somebody if they had some implant, like a cochlear implant, but it gave them an extended hearing range, then maybe yes. But I think we're looking for a bit more, an enhancement, but it's integral technology. That's a transhumanist. It's a post-humanist, it's a cyborg, that's my view. The technology is integral and it enhances. I find the biohacking community, it's refreshingly exciting. I'm not saying that to be politically correct or to please anybody. I find it particularly exciting. I wish the academic community was a bit more like 
the biohacking community. Because there's a lot of guys, and I say that in an inclusive way, who are trying all sorts of different pieces of technology. Some of it I regard, it's absolutely crazy. What are they doing there? But I say that again in a positive way. I'm really interested in what they're doing. They take a lot of risks. Um, from a medical point of view, I, I work with a lot of doctors and some of the risks that the, some of the biohackers are taking just in terms of infection, um, is, it really is pushing the limits there. My name's Nova Rain and uh, I'm a body modification artist, so I do body piercings and various modifications as well. Pros and cons of biohacking, I mean, pros, you can do things with your body that you'd never otherwise be able to do. Um, Arguments against that is things like the things we're using them for now. So, for example, door entry. Like, well, you could just enter your door with the swipe card that you've got anyway. Why would you really want to put that in your hand? Well, it just makes it easier. And it's something that you don't have to worry about carrying that card around with you. You don't have to worry about somebody stealing that card. It's then just a part of you and it's something you never have to think about again. And I suppose the cons of, of this sort of thing is that because it's so recent, so recently developed, there's not much in the way of testing for this sort of thing long term in people's bodies and the effects that this might have on us. But there's, there's loads and loads of people that are willing to be guinea pigs for this, again, just because people think it's cool and they want to be a part of this experiment and they want, to, they want to be there when this technology is being developed and coming to life and they want to say, yes, I was there first, I helped through all this, this beta testing phase and you know we, we came up with something that was really good. Yeah. During my research on the subject of biohacking, one individual kept cropping up, a self-proclaimed biohacker and transhumanist who goes by the name Left Ananim. Left's experiments with creating implants that are inserted directly into the body are detailed on her blog, but where Left truly received recognition was after a hacker conference in Berlin many years ago. It is at this conference that Left came into the spotlight and advocated her ideas on practical body modification on a low budget using simple tools and materials easily sourced on the internet. The implants themselves ranged from RFID chips for interfacing with electronics to magnetic implants that detect electromagnetic waves, all of these encased in the human body. Left garnered more attention due to the fact that all surgeries to implant the improvised cybernetics are performed at home with no anaesthetic. Because of British medical legislation, Left does not have access to anaesthetic and no doctor will perform the implant operation. This means that any homemade surgeries that are performed pose a serious health risk and cause excruciating pain, as seen in this footage of one of Left's earlier surgeries. Left's radical thoughts on DIY implants have made her a divisive figure in the transhumanist movement. Some consider Left reckless, while others consider her a pioneer, someone bringing the cyberpunk ethos to life. Because of this, Left has gathered a small cult following online, and has even been the inspiration for a graphic novel. Left's passion for cybernetics and biohacking started while she attended university. Left was at the top of her computer science class at the University of Aberdeen. It is during this time she started experimenting on herself and documenting her efforts. But Left's health declined while at university, forcing her to remove herself from the course, reluctantly leaving behind a promising career in computing, and updates on her blog became sparse. Over time, she became withdrawn. However, Left has started to re-emerge from her depression making media appearances and spreading ideas about biohacking. She has granted me an interview and a chance to get to know the infamous biohacker. I first got involved with transhumanism when I started university. Um, I'd started a computer science degree and I was really interested in this philosophy. It really spoke to me. So I started reading around it and I read the Wikipedia page and. I, I realised that a lot of people who were involved in it were involved in a kind of really theoretical sort of way. People were writing books about how they thought the future would look and you know, they, there were a lot of futurists and a lot of theory but there wasn't very much practice 
there, there weren't very many individual people doing any kind of experiments. So I, I just sort of wanted to get involved with that by myself. I, I wanted to contribute some kind of practical research to it. The implants I have, I have some magnetic nodes which are for sensing electromagnetic radiation. Various devices that you'll find around electronic devices give off electric fields and that's what these are for. They, they sense it, they let you feel it as a sort of tingling sensation. Um, I've also got an RFID tag in here which is a, a little microchip that lets various machines equipped with a reader recognize which chip it is uniquely. So you can do things like, I had a keyboard for a while that wouldn't log on to a computer unless my particular tag was present. So I was the only person that could use the keyboard because nobody else would have the same unique tag. These in here, this lump you can see here, that's a, a set of test implants. They're, they're in there to, just to see if my body will reject them or not. They're a long-term experiment. The magnetic nodes, they let you sense the electromagnetic fields around you. It's a whole new sort of set of sensory input that I, I had never had before I had these implants and it's fascinating to see what kind of devices give off, what kind of field and how strong they are, how far away they are. The cons of these ones are that because they're little magnets, um, there's certain equipment that I can't go near anymore. An MRI scanner in particular in a hospital that is powered by a giant, incredibly strong electromagnet. So it means that I couldn't go anywhere near it when it was working. Um, if I did, it's not like my hand would just be pulled towards the magnet. I, they would be ripped out of my hand. They would be horrible. So you have to wear a medical bracelet that says you can't go near an MRI just in case something happens to you and you've been taken to hospital and, and scanned without them knowing that this was in your hand. The substance that they're made out of, neodymium, these nodes, is a rare earth metal, but it's not actually compatible with the human body. If you just put a raw piece of neodymium inside your finger, it'll degrade. It breaks down, the body starts encasing it in scar tissue. You can see that happen with one of mine here. This is my only failed experiment here, where I, I didn't use the right kind of coating and the coating broke down, the body got through to the neodymium and it started. That's why there's this big lump because it's encased in scar tissue inside so obviously the node doesn't work anymore. But that's what bioproofing is there to prevent. One of the things I use for bioproofing is a, a moldable kind of silicon putty called Sugru. It's meant for repairing tools and stuff but it's very useful. I found that it makes a really good coating. Silicon is completely impermeable to the body. It doesn't react to it, doesn't care that it's there at all. I, I do a few tests before I put something into like underneath my skin and um, one of the best ways to test this beforehand is uh, I, I test it with bacon and if you think that something might degrade inside the body one of the best ways to find out whether it will or won't is to get your little piece of whatever it is you think might degrade and roll it up inside a piece of bacon and then put it in the fridge and just leave it there for as long as you can I've, I've had roommates who have suffered through rotting bacon in the fridge for, for weeks and weeks with bits of metal inside, but if it, if it degrades inside the bacon, then the likelihood is that it probably will inside your body and you shouldn't put it there. For the surgery that I do at home, um, most of it is in preparation. I try and make everything as sterile as I possibly can. You have to be so careful with killing germs germs are the number one problem with all of this. A tiny bit of dirt or germs gets into a wound that you've made. Things can just get so horribly infected. At the, the first implant that I ever did, I left the wound open too long and it got incredibly infected. My, my whole, not just the finger that I tried to put the implant in, but all the way down my hand and all up my arm, was a green line of infected blood and it, it was my my whole arm was throbbing and infected it was horrible so for for any kind of surgery that i do uh, the first thing i do is get a flat surface that can be properly disinfected and scrub it down with bleach after everything's scrubbed down and all the tools are laid out then i need a spotter somebody who can help me if anything goes wrong somebody who can just check that i'm i'm okay all the time and can pass me things that i need 
they have their hands scrubbed, they wear gloves if they can, and then I take anything sterile out of its packet, do whatever I need to do with making wounds and installing things, and then clear everything away. A lot of things get thrown out because they can only be used once for sterile reasons, and then bandage everything up and we're good. For the magnet implants, it's incredibly painful to do the surgery. It, it hurts so much that for a second when you punch the needle into your finger, you, you can't see, your vision whites out for a bit because of how much it hurts. It, your, your fingers are one of the most sensitive regions in your body. The only places more sensitive than that are um, certain down below bits and your cornea and your eye. But your fingertips are incredibly nerve ending rich and it hurts so bad to do this. Unless you're a qualified piercer or a qualified doctor, it's completely illegal to do anything on another person that involves a scalpel or a needle or something because the law considers it to be you doing medical procedures or tattooing procedures on another person. You can end up going to jail for about 10 years or so. So the, the first thing is that I can't do anything to another person. Doing things on myself is, is the second thing, and that seems to be very legally grey. The people that I've spoken to about it haven't really been sure whether or not it's legal for me to do things by myself or not. But because I'm not putting anyone else in danger other than myself, whereas if I was doing experiments on other people, I'd be putting someone else in danger of infection and pain and, and things gone wrong. So because I'm only putting myself in danger doing experiments on myself, I, I don't think anyone would really be bothered to prosecute me. I, I get a few different typical responses from people. Some people are really supportive. Some people think, oh, you know, this is really interesting and I hope you find out some, some interesting results from it. Uh, a lot of people are really grossed out by it. People that, even people who were interested in first and then they want to feel where the implants are inside my fingers, or inside the back of my hand and then they, they actually feel it moving around in there and they just go oh, oh no oh no i can't stand that oh that's gross oh some people have a needle phobia or something so when i tell them about the great big five millimeter diameter needle that i use to do it they, they just freak out and they can't handle it and that there are a very few people who are very religious and they they see any kind of implant as uh, you know the mark of the beast uh, an evil thing that you shouldn't be messing with, something that's against nature. And there's not very many people like that really, but and they're, they're entitled to believe what they want, but they, they really don't like that. After I'd been in Berlin and had the conference, I started to get a lot of really strange email from people. A lot of people write in and they ask for wrist-mounted weapons. Some guys want like wolverine claws that they'll be able to extend at people. And uh, quite a few guys want wrist-mounted flamethrowers. There, there's a lot of weird things that people want out there. The next project that I'm working on is something that I call the Southpaw. Um, it's based on an existing device called the Northpaw, which is made by a hacker collective called Sensebridge in America. And this is basically a, a, an anklet that you wear around your, your ankle that is made of a ring of electrodes connected to a little microprocessor. This processor has a compass module on it and it's constantly polling the compass module to tell where north is. So every few milliseconds it finds out where north is and it makes the electrode that's closest to where north is buzz. So you've got this constant little sensation that will tell you where north physically is. Let you navigate in a city, let you look at a map and constantly know where north is. And that's fascinating, but there are some drawbacks of just wearing it as an anklet. For a start, it looks a lot like a bomb. So uh, if you're going through something like TSA security in America in the airport or the airport in the UK, um, they're going to think you have a bomb on your ankle and they're probably going to arrest you and maybe shoot you. And other thing, problems, you can't wear it in the shower. It, it's quite bulky, you know, so it's great as a foundation for a device, but what I really wanted to do was make an implanted version of this device, something that would be constantly a part of you, that you wouldn't have to take off to get in the shower or the bath, you wouldn't have to keep changing the batteries, something that would just be a part of you that would give the same kind of haptic feedback. Haptics is uh, something that doesn't require you to look at it to check. 
something that will just basically be part of your sensory sphere. So this is what I call the South Board. This is an implanted version of this North Board device. And when it's finished, it would just be an implanted compass that would constantly let you know where North was without you having to stop and think about it. And it's, it's very simplistic. And yeah, like some people say, you don't need to constantly know where North is. But I find that the more complex devices we make, the more they can be foundations for further kind of research. So if I manage to get this right and get it working, then maybe someone else would be able to make something that was more useful. A lot of people say, oh, well, you shouldn't be doing any of this experimentation. You should just sit back and wait for Google or Apple or Microsoft to create these things instead of you developing them as just a, a hacker with no money. I, I think the more things that are created by companies, the more likely it is that they might not be completely under the control of the person who they're implanted in. And because I believe in the idea of bodily sovereignty, which means that whatever is inside your body should be completely under your control. I, I would feel extremely violated if I knew that there was some way that someone other than me could control the implants inside me. I do get asked a lot, why do I do this? And to be honest, the most basic answer is just for knowledge. This, the, the whole point of all of my experiments is to gain some kind of fundamental knowledge so that other people don't have to go through the same pain and the same failed experiments to gain the same knowledge. All I want to do really is gain a, a really fundamental bedrock of, of experimental knowledge. Things that work, things that don't, you know, bioproofing bio stuff that works, stuff that doesn't, this works as a covering, this doesn't, this is the best technique, this technique is suboptimal, so that people who come after me can look at what I've done and improve on it without having to go through months and months and months of, of finding out first. If I die and all I've done at the end of my life is contribute this kind of basic knowledge to biohacking, then to be honest, I'll be happy because the major point of me doing all of this is to get knowledge so that other people don't have to go through the same pain to get it. I think biohacking, the cyborg, sex transhumanism, is like a new continent where we just don't know what's on that continent. We're just sketching around the edges at the moment and it's through experimentation that we will find out about it. So I think try and be as safe as you possibly can. But if you want to find out whether it's going to work or not, have a go with it. But let me know what you're doing, because I'd like to find out from a more academic point of view that we can all learn and, and future biohackers possibly can learn from it. I'm pretty confident biohacking is going to go worldwide. I think once, once there is enough um, viable applications for, for the implants that we have once there's enough functionality behind them. Um, I think easily, once that ball starts rolling, I think it's going to pick up really, really quickly. I think even within the next five years, we're going to see this explode in a big way. My time with Left was interesting, but I felt that I had just scratched the surface of biohacking. There is a whole community of grinders who look out for each other, share ideas, and are constantly pushing the boundaries of self-modification. Whatever the future has in store for Left and her experiments is uncertain. But what is certain is Left's desire to explore the boundaries of self-modification. i